Grace, peace, and mercy are yours, from God the Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for all our sins. Amen. God's word before us tonight is found in Acts chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any men or women belonging to the way, he might bring them to Jerusalem as prisoners. As he went on his way and was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? He replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you need to do. The men traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but did not see anyone. They raised Saul up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. They took him by the hand and led him to Damascus. For three days he could not see, and he did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord told him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. In fact, at this very moment, he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he can regain his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man and how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord said to him, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the people of Israel. Indeed, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias left and entered the house. Laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom you saw on your way here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is God's word. Have you ever wanted to be famous? Have you ever had dreams about being famous? Maybe you're uh, uh, an actor or an actress out in Hollywood. Or maybe you dream that you, were, you, dream that you want to be uh, a professional athlete, a star athlete on the basketball court, or out on the football field, or on the baseball diamond. I had dreams like that growing up. I can tell you there are even times in in my adult life that I have little dreams or wishes to be famous. But as I get older, I can also see that it's not all it's cut out to be, to be famous as well. You know, if you're a famous actor or you're a famous, famous athlete, you can't go into everyday places without getting swarmed all over, ask for autographs. You have people constantly taking pictures of you. I don't envy that part of being famous at all, but it goes along with it. As I'm getting older, maybe my thoughts of wanting to be famous have turned from that to maybe wanting to be related to somebody who's famous. And you can kind of bask in, the, in, the, in their shadow and, and, uh, and enjoy a lot of the things that go with it. You don't have to have a lot of grief that goes with it. That's why I kind of hope that my daughter is going to be a famous author someday, and I could bask in, in, in all of that uh, uh, limelight and all that, but then not have all the headaches that come with it either. I think about those things as we look tonight at the second article of the Apostles' Creed. Last week, we were reminded about how Jesus became one of us. He became our brother. 
And tonight as we follow the life of the Apostle Paul, and we see how he revealed God to us and to the world, we see tonight that our big brother is in charge. He is the one who is famous and does everything that is needed for us. And we see that so vividly in the life of Saul, later to become the Apostle Paul. Saul was a man who thought that he was doing God a favor. You could call him a religious man. He was a man that, in fact, he describes himself in Scripture in his letters as a wise man, as a teacher of law, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was one who held up and honored God's law. And Saul, early on in his life, felt that he was doing God a favor by persecuting Christians, by arresting them, by having them thrown in jail. In fact, the book of Acts tells us a few chapters before our text tonight that Saul was standing and present at the martyrdom of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. As Stephen was being stoned to death, Saul didn't pick up the stones, any of the stones that killed Stephen, but he held the jackets of all the men who, who stoned Stephen to death and gave his approval. In our text for tonight, we see that he is going from Jerusalem to Damascus. He's got uh, the approval of the synagogue leaders and the religious leaders in Jerusalem to go to Damascus and persecute Christians that were in that city north of Israel. Almost a hundred mile trip. And I think it's safe to say that Saul was looking forward to that. And as he was going with the soldiers and the men that were with him, all of a sudden he was stopped dead in his tracks. He saw a bright light. He couldn't see anything else. All of the men that were standing around him, they were knocked off their horses as well. They couldn't hear anything. They heard some grumblings and things like that. Only Saul could hear the voice. And he heard a question come from a thundering voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul asks, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, Jesus said. Here Saul has a face-to-face -face meeting with the risen and ascended Lord Jesus. He has a meeting with Jesus in all of his glory, the Almighty God. Nothing humbling about this at all. Jesus is making of all of his powers and traits as the divine. Saul is scared. He doesn't know what's going on. But the Lord stopped him dead in his tracks. He was going to turn it around. Notice some things here. Okay? First of all, Saul thought that he was doing something wonderful for the Lord. He thought he had his, his whole life and his standing before God all figured out. He thought that he was such a wonderful person that he had kept God's law so wonderfully and so well that his works were going to get him into heaven. He thought that there was something inherent in him, something that he was born with, something about him and his personality that just God, God just had to love. And then to top it off, these people that called themselves Christians, these followers of Christ, these ones who are trying to, to, to desecrate the Old Testament and God's law, well, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth and do God a favor. But on this road to Damascus, Jesus stops Saul dead in his tracks and turns him around completely in the opposite direction. Maybe in Saul, you and I can see Jesus working in us too. How many times do we think that we have life figured out? How many times don't we think that we have our spiritual standing before God worked out? The little Pharisee of our sinful nature likes to think that God is so pleased with who we are and what we do 
that he's just got to give us a hug and say, come on, good boy, good girl, march right on into heaven. We think to ourselves, I try to, you know, I try to be good to people. I'm not a robber. I'm not a criminal. I haven't killed anybody. You know, I'm a pretty decent individual. God's got to appreciate that. But we're heading in the wrong direction, just like Saul. And you know what? The Lord came and turned you and me around, just like he did Saul. Maybe not in such a spectacular fashion, but I say that could be debatable. It maybe wasn't bright lights and a thundering voice, but it was with the word of God. When it was first spoken to you, whether it was verbally or when that word was put into physical form at your baptism, and faith was worked in your heart. Your heart was turned from stone to a heart of faith for Jesus. Turned from heading towards hell and brought back to the Lord, just like Saul. That is what our risen and ascended Lord does for us. He is, you could say, large and in charge. When we confess in the Apostles' Creed that we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, crucified, died, and was buried. This is the Savior that appeared to, 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 to Saul. And this is the same Savior that has worked in your life and mine. Saul didn't know what to do. This man who had been, uh, thought he had it all figured out and knew where he was going, after Jesus appeared to him and the light disappeared, he was blind. He couldn't see. This man who was trying to racing so triumphantly towards the city of Damascus now was stumbling around in the dark and needed to be led by the hand to Damascus. And when he got there, he was taken to a place on a street called Straight, to a man's house who was a Christian by the name of Ananias. And then we're told that Jesus appeared to Ananias in a vision and said, Ananias, someone is coming to see you. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to heal him of his blindness, and then I want you to baptize him. Who is it, Lord? Saul of Tarsus. Are you nuts, Lord? Do you know what you're doing? We see a couple of things here with our brother who is in charge, our Lord Jesus. Jesus knows where we're at, and he comes to where we're at. He knew Saul's pitiful spiritual condition. He knew that he needed help and healing physically and spiritual. He knew where these soldiers were taking him because our Lord knows everything. And he met Saul where he was at and sent him when he needed it. And the Lord does the same with us. Our all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving Savior meets us wherever we're at. He knows where we're at. Whether we live out on the ranch, whether we live on First Street, whether we work on the ranch, whether we work at the bank, whether we're a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, the Lord knows where we're at, and he comes and meets us where we're at, just like he did with Saul. And then he also knows what we need, even though sometimes we might think we have better ideas. Saul needed a Savior. Saul needed the forgiveness of sins. Saul needed the gift of eternal life. When Ananias, God's servant, heard what Saul, that Saul was coming to him, I can't say I wouldn't have reacted the same. Lord, are you crazy? Do you, don't you know what this man has done? Don't you know how much blood from innocent Christians is on his hands? Don't you know that he's just trying to destroy your church? Lord, let him rot, let him go to hell. The Lord said, no, I've made it my own. 
I turn him around. I am going to use him to help spread my gospel throughout the world. There, our brother who is in charge, the risen, ascended Lord, is the one who's in control, even when we think that we know better. He's the one that has taken us and made us his own through the blood of Christ. In his love, he reached out to you and to me with the gospel. And how many people, how many people that know us, how many people that we've encountered maybe would think those things about us like Ananias thought about Saul. Lord, do you know what that person's really like? Do you really think that they deserve anything that you have to give them? Do you know what their sins are? Do you know how they scoff at you and, and ignore your will and your law? He said about all of us. But our brother who's in charge, our risen, ascended, and glorified Lord, he's in charge of everything for us. He came to us. He's made us his own. He gives us every single thing that we need. And what a blessed truth that is as we confess and remember who our Savior is for us. That there is nothing that goes past his notice. And that we have this blessed promise from him because he is in charge. That no matter what happens in this world, he uses it. Like the Apostle Paul says too in his letter to the Romans, he says, all things work for the good of those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. Why is that? It's because Jesus is in charge. Yes, we live in a sinful world where things go bad, things go wrong. Sinful people try to, to do bad and evil things. But the Lord even takes that evil, whether it's ours or the evil of others, and uses it to work for our good. We have a Savior who won heaven for us. And we have a Savior who will stop at nothing bring us to himself, to keep us in his arms, and to lead us by the hand to our eternal reward that he has won for us in heaven. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for the collection of the offering.